Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Strategy in Future. My name is Jacek Bartosiak, and today I am with uh, Thomas uh, Gomat, uh, the director of uh, the French Institute of Foreign uh, Relations. In French, it's, and forgive my, you know, my, my uh, wrong pronunciation, but it's uh, a director de l'Institut Français de Relations Internationales, uh, IFRI. Uh, again, pardon my sort of, you know, my, my, my language, but I, I really wanted to convey the, 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 the full name of your institution. And uh, uh, my guest, uh, my distinguished guest uh, wrote a book that we at Strategy in Future have read. Let me show, and I hope it's visible for the viewers. It's uh, uh, Guerre Invisible, uh, Wars Invisible in English. Uh, I hope that the translation is proper and properly conveys the message. Um, so this is a book about the shift, uh, and I read it, of course. So this is a book about the shift in, uh, in the world. Uh, expand it, please, uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, if you just could uh, expand on that uh, notion, uh, what the shift is all about and why things are invisible. First of all, Jacek, thank you very much for your invitation. It's uh, a real pleasure for me to to have this uh, discussion. If you remember, we, we met a couple of years in, uh, in Warsaw and uh, I, I remember uh, an exchange on geopolitics. Um, to, to be back to your, to your questions, two things maybe to, to define or to explain to you this, um, this title. Um, Guerre Invisible is an answer to a book which uh, was published by two uh, Chinese officers in 1999, which has been translated into French in 2003. And the title was uh, in French, like Guerre or Limits. In, in English, I would say the, the war without limitation. I think it's restricted and warfare. I think. I restricted uh, warfare, yeah. Restrict yeah I, I read it in, in, in French. Uh, at that time, you know, I was uh, teaching in, um, at the uh, Ecole uh, Special Military School of Saint Cyr, Quedon. And uh, I asked my, uh, my students, I mean, the, the, the cadet officer, to, to read it because it was a fascinating book explaining that um, the military uh, lost its monopoly uh, on warfare. And the two uh, authors listed uh, 24 types of war, coming from nuclear war to uh, environmental war or financial war and so on. And um, 20 years after, almost 20 years after, uh, I read an article published during the first lockdown by one of the uh, two authors um, who explained something very obvious, but maybe something uh, which has been forgotten, especially in Europe. It is he, he said that to be uh, a technological power, you, you should be, first of all, uh, able to uh, build up things, to be a manufacturer. And uh, I think that um, this uh, obvious fact, as I said, has been for forgotten. So the very first thing, it is to say that Guerre Invisible is um, an answer to this, uh, to this book. The second thing, it is, uh, uh, it is based on the division of the book. The book is divided into two main parts. The first one, it is uh, the visible one, and the second one, the in invisible things. You know, it's like an iceberg to some extent. It's to say that y y there are things you can see um, very, very easily and there are uh, other things under, under the, the, the sea which are invisible. That, that's the idea. And, I, and what is important for me, it is obviously the links between both parts. So the first part is divided into um, four chapters, first conflicts, which are visible for sure. Uh, second, um, environ environment. I will be back on that because um, I think it's uh, also visible the degradation of environment. Third, uh, trade. Uh, even if there are some uh, um, stop and go in the Suez Channel, it's very visible. And fourth, uh, inequalities, which are also vis very visible. And for the other parts, which are more invisible, you know, it's much more process. I would say um, 
underneath processes. Uh, first of all, the fact that uh, you have numerization, you have innovation, you have dissimulation, and you have control, which are less uh, easy to, to, to be seen in a, in a first approach. So that's my uh, quite long explanation for this uh, title. Uh, yeah, I find uh, find the you know the, the the division of the book and the chapters very interesting, including the titles and the ideas for titles. Uh, if I may say two sentences, it's a survey of the un ongoing things and developments uh, of the world. That uh, and I share this opinion will have a direct bearing on the future of Europe and on the future of uh, humanity. Uh, I find it also interesting that, that you touch on the uh, cl classical geopolitics, including Mackinder and, uh, and other th theorists who, who dealt with it. Um, uh, and you, you, you keep asking questions uh, because this is a book that uh, does not provide uh, the answers. I mean, it does, but it, it's not complete with answers. It, it tends to ask questions, which is, uh, by the way, uh, best strategy because strategy as Colin Gray used to say is mostly about asking good questions and the answers will come in time uh, so that's in a, in, in, in a perfect line with uh, with with the great books on on strategy uh, anyway everything what you write in this book pivots around one grand development which is a competition between US and China between the the West and China between the last 500 years of the domination of the West and China. Uh, how would you react to, to, to this assessment of mine uh, that it pivots around this, this main, actually this main um, aspect? First of all, to, 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 to react to your, to your comment. Um, no, Guerres Invisible for me, it is not um, a wait and see horizon. I mean, the main argument is to say we, we are already involved in these uh, invisible wars. So, so it's very important for Europeans, in my view, to understand that. It's not something which, in my view, will come. It is something already there. And that's why, you know, at the end of each chapter, I try to, to elaborate very quickly on the hidden intention of... Um, uh, the three main actors, which are China, the US, and Europe, even if for Europe, obviously, to speak about uh, its uh, its intention is it, much more challenging given the, the nature of, um, of, of, of the EU. Um, second, about, you know, this um, antagonism between China and the uh, and US, yes, I think that's the, the, the main um, uh, elements right now of the uh, uh, on the international scene, but um, I think that this um, antagonism should be thought with um, something wider, which is the convergence between two things. The very first one it is the um, degradation of environment with uh, three main elements: climate change. Uh, pollution and loss of uh, of uh, biodiversity. So we have this trend, and we have another trend, which is the propagation propagation of technologies. Uh, and we are in this doxa that the second trend uh, will be the solution for the first one. And uh, I'm not so sure. For a reason, I, I try to elaborate on um, in in uh, in the book. But it's a way for me to say that at the time being, one argument in the book is to say that China and the US are uh, subordinating their respective uh, climate policies and digital policies to their uh, strategic rivalry. I mean, we do think uh, in terms of public good for climate, you know, in the EU, um, as I explained in, in the book, I don't think that's the way of thinking for a Chinese and a US strategist. Mm -hmm. So it's just to remind that, you know, China and the US represent together more than 45% um, of the 
global um, uh, dioxide ga uh, gas emission. It's also to remind that uh, both uh, countries are very far away the uh, two highest military spending uh, in the world with a, a, a gap between the US and, and China. And that's certainly uh, two countries uh, which are still able to have a grand strategy, ability to project force in very different ways. So the main, one of the main differences between China and the US, it is certainly the fact that the US has a system of military uh, alliances. Uh, that's, not, that's not the case for, for, for China, but China is able also to have a a sort of a global uh, geoeconomic approach um, on the Earthland towards, uh, I would say, uh, uh, towards, yes, Europe, in Africa, in Latin America. Uh, so you, so you, you, sorry, Thomas, you mentioned Heartland. Yeah. You understand the inner Eurasian yeah. landmass, you mean, by Heartland, yeah? yeah. Uh, by by McKinder's uh, thesis, right? That's uh, yeah. yeah. And as you know, the... One of the ba basic uh, elements in the U.S. strategic culture is to avoid that there is a, a dominating power or a combination of uh, two dominating powers on the Atlantic, because uh, it could have the idea to go to the U.S. That's basically uh, at the core of the U.S. Uh, strategic uh, culture. So that's why, you know, I, I insist on this uh, tension between China and, and the US. The second element, it is to say that this uh, tension, the, the, the core, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, like the go game. It's uh, the ability of uh, both players to have um, the control of uh, connecting points. I mean, connecting points, it is, you know, uh, points for interdependence and the ability like a barrier to uh, open or to close this bar barrier by political or economic decision. So you have many connecting points and different actors would like to control them. Europe controls some connecting points, fortunately. Um, and the, the, the third argument, it is to say that this uh, antagonism between China and the US is completely different than the one between USSR and, uh, the, uh, and the United States during the Cold War. For one uh, visible reason, the two economies are narrowly interconnected. Uh, during the Cold War, the main allies of uh, the US were uh, their main trade partners. It's not out of the case. We have two uh, interconnected uh, economies. The same can be said for the economy between uh, uh, Europe and the US and Europe and, and, and China. And that, that creates, you know, some um, vacuum for um, other powers, especially around Europe. I mean, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, for instance, so um, that's creating this antagonism between China and, 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 um, and uh, the US is creating some vacuum for other actors which do want to play geopolitics. That's basically the, the third argument you know in the, in the book. Yeah, that's apparently a change in, in, in the paradigm, uh, the shift in our uh, perception, right? Including the European perception of, of how the world affairs are run, the, 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 the former 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, seems to some to be the end of the history, right? And, uh, and uh, I, I promise to the viewers that I will ask our guest uh, about the French grant strategy, how the French strategic community is thinking that through. That would be uh, utterly interesting for myself, for sure. But before I, I arrive at this, at this point, uh, I, I haven't found in your book, uh, and I, I, th I think it's, uh, it's on purpose, uh, what uh, would be the result of this competition between US and China in the long run? Uh, or maybe I misunderstood the, 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 you know, the, the message that you're, you're, tr you're trying to convey. What are, if you just could, I could sort of lure you to, uh, to, 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 you know, to debate a little bit 
what would be the centers of gravity, the, the flashpoints, not only, you know, like the strays or the maritime, but you said technology, environment, maybe, you know, AIs, where will be the, the, the flashpoints where this competition will be resolved uh, to show who is winning, to, to, to find the milestones, to check who is winning and where the world is moving? Uh... I, I think to, to respond to this very difficult question, we, we, we should decide what sort of um, historical starting point we have in mind. Um, you know, until the, um, the 18th uh, century, chi China represented approximately uh, 25 30% uh, of uh, the, 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 global, um, the global value. Um, and I think that this proportion should be kept in mind because certainly China is recovering the, this part, you know, in the uh, worldwide wealth. Around, I would say, 30 percent, maybe less, but around 30%. Um, that is a way for me to be back to the beginning, you know, of the, uh, and that's something I, I, I do uh, in the book, at the beginning of the um, 15th century, when Portuguese uh, left from Europe to go to Africa and afterward to connect to Asia with a system, you know, of uh, different arbor, um, it was not to, to, to conquer it was much more to be connected to a much more uh, powerful ASEAN economy and especially a Chinese economy. What is very interesting for me um, to, to, to be observed, you know, five centuries after, is the fact that the Chinese are um, now present in Portuguese uh, uh, harbors on the... Um, Atlantic, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. So you have this sort of, um, you know, um, long-term perspective we, 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 we should have in mind. And, and from this perspective, the relation between uh, uh, the US and um, Europe is also very uh, critical, very important. I think that the transatlantic relation remained, you know, the backstone for Europeans, for different reason. First of all, military alliance through NATO. But maybe more important, I think that the financial links between Europe and the US is uh, so uh, substan substantive and also the technological links. Just, uh, just a figure to, to reflect on that, you know, uh, in 2020, the level of exchanges for goods for physical goods uh, between uh, China and Europe was higher for the first time than the level of exchange of physical goods between uh, uh, Europe and the US. Okay, but if you have, if you add, sorry, uh, services, the level of uh, exchanges between uh, the US and Europe is almost forty-five percent higher than the level of uh, exchanges between Europe and China. And that's very important in my view to have this figure in mind because it's reflecting the transformation of the uh, international um, uh, economics, to put things bluntly. You know, we are very um, comfortable, I mean, it's not the proper wording, but we do understand in our business quite well the geopolitics of oil and gas, you know, which was uh, established during the two world wars. And we do understand quite well how does it work, you know, with the producing countries, with, with the consumers, the, 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 the production channels, the securization of this production channel, channel and so on. What is much more difficult for not right now, it is the overlapping between a, a, a global geopolitics of oil with the new global geopolitics of data. And that's much more difficult for Europeans to understand that. 
because if you uh, observe, you know, the uh, market capitalization, uh, uh, I have this figure in the book, you know, in June 2020, the market capi capitalization of the seven um, bigger tech companies was uh, uh, 7,200 billion of dollars. And the market capitalization of the seven bigger, bigger sorry, uh, energy companies was uh, 2,500 billion dollars. So that's, mm. that's a massive change. And by the way, in these 14 companies, you have only one European company. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so, so the change is, is absolutely massive. And not well, you know. Um, uh, 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 so, to, to respond to your question about flashpoints, um, I think for sure it is um, uh, on technology that it will be uh, uh, very visible. But it will be also on all the things for the transition, for the um, uh, uh, geopolitics of energy. And on that, there are many things which should be uh, followed carefully. Yeah, very interesting point you made about uh, the revolution of information, information becoming a commodity, right? And, and a weapon as well. Mm, uh, but, but by the way, I, I always, now I recall, I always wanted to ask a, a, an expert a strategic thinker from Western Europe, like yourself. Uh, is it so that uh, the European Union is uh, shooting uh, 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 its own foot by restraining, uh, you know, the access to data, personal data, so much, uh, making uh, European Union not competitive on this global market of processing data? This is the argument that they have heard on many occasions in Singapore and other places in business communities in Asia that why are the Europeans doing it? It's like, you know, like the Chinese burning their ships, you know, uh, prior to, to Vasco da Gama and stuff, or the Arabs banning some sort of uh, sections of science uh, in the mm -hmm. Middle Ages, yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, um, it's one thing to have, you know, data, to stock them, to control them, to export them, and that's another thing to to have value from this data. And the problem for Europeans, it is the fact not to produce data, but it is much more to, to get the proper proportion of value related to the amount of data, if you see what I mean. I mean, it, 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 it takes time for Europeans to understand um, the, um, uh, what was done by the systemic platforms. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the platform, systemic platforms uh, were or are attracting a large part of the value created by Europeans. Mm -hmm. So I think it's much more complicated than only to say, yes, you, you just be open and to, and to enjoy you know, um, the uh, circulation of data. We do know that it doesn't work in this way. And mm -hmm. if Europeans are in this sort, continue to be in this sort of uh, uh, docs are promoted, you know, by business schools, by the the um, the uh, systemic platform themselves, explaining that that's empowerment, individual empowerment, and so on. They are naive, really naive. The problem for Europeans it's uh, to uh, it's not to 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 benefit from um, strat uh, systemic platforms for individual data. That's why we. We did the uh, uh, GDPR to try to protect European consumer. It's uh, a, a response, which is certainly not sufficient. But now the real battle, I mean, the battle for individual data um, has been lost by Europeans. So now the, the, the battle is for industrial data. Uh, and with the uh, um, internet of things, we do know and with the lockdown and its consequences, the lockdowns, I, would, I should say, and its consequences, we do know that, you know, the trade of physical goods um, will maybe will plateau or maybe will uh, decrease slightly, 
But when one thing is completely sure, it is the increase of the flux of data. Uh, the more we, we will continue, the more we will produce uh, data. And we are in a situation in which the um, way of producing is more and more related to the control of data. And for that, you know, Europeans benefit from very uh, capable industrial actors. And that's the battlefield right now, you know, this ability to organize uh, what is called by the commission, you know, data reserves and to use them uh, for um, creating value in Europe. It's not to say without uh, um, uh, systemic platforms coming from China and the US or, or from other parts, but to uh, keep control of this data to benefit much more from the value created from this data. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, another interesting point. Uh, my attention was also drawn in your book uh, to the chapter about, which in French is called Controle, uh, which as I gathered well, is about the, uh, the position of the US dollar in the world system. Uh, you know, would, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because it was always the French, uh, including I think one of your finance ministers that coined the, the, the term of uh, this privilege that the U.S. is having. And uh, now, you know, the, the, the test is coming. Yeah? And we see what's going on in the United States in, term, in terms of the U.S. treasuries and uh, uh, fiscal and uh, debt issues. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are you writing in this book about, uh, if you just could say to the broader audience, in this, in this chapter yeah. of, of the Bretton Woods and the U.S. dollar system? Yeah. Uh, in, in France, you're right, you know, there, there is this notion of the, the dollar as a privilege exorbitant, which mm -hmm. is also uh, the title um, of a book by Barry Eching Green, for instance. We, we don't know if it's, it was said by uh, General de Gaulle or by Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's not the point. What is much more important, it is, in fact, mm -hmm. um, what was said by, um, by Connelly, you know, in 1971. When he said um, to Europeans, uh, uh, the dollar is all currency, but your problem. Yeah, and it is still it is still the case. But something I try to explain for me the real turning point. It is uh, 1971, 1972, with the end of um, uh, equivalence. Uh, I don't know the proper word in English. Sorry, uh, between gold and and dollar. And second, the trip made by Nixon and Kissinger to China with Mao in 1972, which was at the same time to prepare the exit strategy from Vietnam, but also uh, to uh, weak USSR. So uh, we are now two generations after this uh, rupture, uh, 50, almost 50 years. What is also very interesting in my view, it is the direct connect between the um, uh, ultra-liberalism promoted you know, by Reagan and uh, in Europe, Margaret Thatcher, and the opening of the Chinese market at the beginning of the 80s. It's, com it's narrowly connected. And I think we are now at the end of this cycle which uh, leads to a, a fundamental question about the future of capitalism. Uh, what will be the new market? Some, and the uh, social contract connected, yes. And yeah, the social... Some, some think that it can be African countries, for instance, over think that it will be India, but um, <laughs> it's completely impossible to have the same type of development and its consequences for the global capitalism with China in the future for uh, namely environmental reasons, for instance, but not only. Mm -hmm. So we are also in a, in a, in a deep crisis of the uh, capitalist uh, system itself uh, in, um, in, uh, in my view. Okay, so finally, uh, let me have this opportunity and ask you a question about Europe. What is Europe then in 2021 in the spring? 
how, what, how do you see it from the perspective of Paris? What is Europe? What, yeah. Where or what? What, 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 what is it? What is oh. Europe? Well, first of all, it's, it's a political prototype uh, which was able um, to, to contribute directly to peace on the uh, European continent since, uh, since uh, the more than uh, 70 years. I mean, for the Western parts. I mean, from your part of Europe, I think that the reading is different for, um, for obvious, uh, obvious reasons. So that's, that's one thing. Second, um, it is part of the world which was very uh, active in terms of uh, promoting globalization. And uh, it is a market, an integrated market, and as a French guy, I think uh, I hope not only on markets. Having said that, uh, I, I, am, I am quite skeptical about the ability of the EU to become a power, to be able to play uh, the power game as it is, uh, as you know, China, uh, the US, Russia, Turkey uh, do. For one reason, which is quite simple. In fact, it is not at the origin of the European project. You know, and as a DNA of the EU, it, it is not to be a, 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 a power project. Uh, so, so it's very difficult to transform, you know, um, uh, something from its uh, initial conception. Uh, and I think that Europe has a future. It depends on its ability to adapt. But we do have some um, some uh, some real tools uh, to continue to contribute to the globalization. So, what is your what is the debate these days then in in France regarding the future of Europe? Uh, First of all, is there a realization that we're in a different world than 10 years ago? And the second, is there any plan to move forward somehow? And what would it look like? In France, not in, I'm not, I'm not oh, asking you know, about the, yes, I, European I, perspective, I, French perspective in particular. Yeah. Um, for sure, the, 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 the vision, you know, is completely different from the one uh, uh, ten, 10 years ago. I think that for European countries, and especially for France, you know, uh, there is something which has not be, been uh, resolved. It is a two, 2005 uh, rejection of the EU treaty just after the, the last uh, enlargement. Uh, as, as you know, after that, we, we had the Lisbon strategy. And part of the problem is certainly the disconnect from that time between the uh, European elites uh, and the opinion. And it, it's already uh, 15 years ago. What is different now in France is the fact that President Macron, and that's a big difference with other uh, French uh, politicians, is pro-European, and he was elected as a pro-European uh, president. That's, that's a big difference with all uh, his competitors. The other thing is that he was elected because of our uh, consistent uh, system with, uh, if I remember well, 23% at the first round. Mm -hmm. And after that, he was against Marine Le Pen, so he was elected with more than uh, 80 persons. But what does it mean? That means that the, the, the three other competitors, Marine Le Pen, François Fillon, and Jean-Luc Mélenchon, had completely different vision of Europe. You know, uh, So we have a pro-European um, president with an opinion which is certainly uh, less pro-European than it was uh, 10 years ago. So that's part of the, of the, of the French challenge regarding, uh, regarding uh, Europe. Having said that, um, you know, before the, the, the lockdowns, um, 
I, I, I traveled extensively uh, in, in, in Europe and not only by the way, but I was very struck by the difference of uh, perception between European capitals about, I would say, uh, the strategic urgency. You have this feeling in Paris of a strategic urgency, uh, and I don't feel uh, this urgency the same way elsewhere in Europe. And it can be explained, you know, by different things. For instance, the, the massive terrorist attacks uh, we suffered uh, since 2015, the involvement, um, you know, uh, in, in Mali, for instance, and also the fact that um, France consider important to explain to its um, uh, European allies and partners, then uh, there is a, a word east of Suez, which, which is also something very important to, to say Europeans, um, our part in the world is reducing and the center of gravity of the uh, a worldwide economy will be much more in the Indo-Pacific than in Europe. So we should be able to be also present in the Indo-Pacific region. And, and I think that's part of, uh, of the challenge we all face, you know, in Europe right now. Okay, so, you know, to, to cut long story short, do you think that the Europeans will side with the US against China and all Spec, full spectrum competition for the next few decades, or the Europeans will walk their own way, which will be difficult anyway, because France and Germany would need to make a decision what they mean by walking together and who is gonna be in charge. And Poland, you know, anyway, will need to be asked as well in the process, but maybe it's not time to discuss in detail. Uh, or if we do not side with the US, for example, and if we do not come to terms who is going to be in charge and where we're going, then it will be like, you know, medieval ages of Europe that, you know, there will be like all those small states uh, compared to the great powers uh, that are competing. Uh, so where is uh, the French strategic community pushing towards which solution? Well, that's Obviously, the, the, the big question, and not only for, for France, I mean, it's also, you know, a, a direct question for, for, for Poland, for instance. You know, the, the China plus uh, 17 is something uh, on which we, uh, we, we, we should think about very, very carefully, for instance. So you, you have the ability to have countries involved in the China plus 17 and also very, very active within NATO. So this sort of tension uh, will be certainly much more visible for for country like yours than for for mine. I think in the in the coming um, in the coming uh, years. Um, you know, for France, you you should understand something, which is uh, which can which can be seen as too too historical. But um, our constitution, and it is something very uh, often uh, forgotten by. Um, our current uh, politicians, but our constitution is, um, I would say, political is a political military one. It was created in um, in uh, uh, I mean, in nineteen um, fifty eight, plus a deep a deep change in nineteen sixty two with the uh, election of the president, which was the same year than the um, uh, access to the nuclear uh, weapon. And that's narrowly related because the idea of the goal was to create a constitution to avoid forever June 1940. And to make that uh, feasible, it is a choice of having the nuclear weapon by yourself. And uh, it, it continues to be the line. So that's, that certainly is a big difference with other European countries. And it will continue. Um, now, with, with, the, with the choice you, 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 have, um, you have mentioned, 
um, there is this debate in the in the French strategic uh, community for for for, for sure. Um, you have you have this um, this idea. You know, for instance, in France, we don't use the the notion of equidistance between China uh, and the US. That's maybe different than what we can have with our uh, German colleagues on that. You know, what was done very well, I think, by uh, Chancellor Merkel was uh, her ability to keep the balance between be open to China in economic terms. And for instance, you know, the uh, last uh, uh, element of this uh, strategy was the uh, agreement on investment in last December. We will see if it could be uh, ratified by the European Parliament, but it was done during the uh, German presidency. And also to stay completely um, uh, active integrating within NATO and this balance. That, that, that's not this equidistance. It's not the, the wording in Paris because we don't, we don't put at all of the same uh, page um, China and the US because uh, China is a democratic country based on the separation of power. Now, if you refer to uh, the uh, uh, strategic document which was uh, published by uh, President Macron since uh, his uh, election, and it was very related to the attitude of uh, the Trump administration, it was, it was said that the three main powers, I mean, the US, Russia and China, or the US, China and Russia, um, uh, challenge, you know, the, the multilater multilateralism in different ways. And that the US is our ally, whereas, you know, China and Russia are not, but should be partners. So that's basically, you know, um, this sort of, uh, of, uh, of position. Um, I think that's what is very important for France right now. It is all the debate about um, uh, uh, the possibility to navigate everywhere, uh, to, to be active, to be present in the Indo-Pacific. As you certainly know, uh, France has strategic partnership with uh, Emirates, with India and with Australia. So that gives also uh, uh, the new... Um, Yes, a sort of new direction for uh, all the French strategy. And you have this idea that uh, obviously it's very important to, to continue to have, uh, to try to, to work with our uh, European partners and allies to secure us uh, by ourselves. We have very strong security arrangement with the UK, which are supposed to continue with Germany with Italy and, uh, and of other countries. And uh, there are some attempts to develop, as you know, also some security and military links uh, with Poland, for, 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 for instance. So that's basically, you know, the positioning. I understand. So, uh, you know, uh, should I understand that there is no clear grand strategy in France now you know, when being pushed by the U.S., because I understand that the pressure from the U.S. is very, really strong. I feel, I think we feel it in Poland, of course, and I can see that, uh, uh, you know, United States may come and bring to bear its geopolitical weight to make, um, to make the European allies uh, choose between them and China. Yeah. There are three levels to, to answer your question on grand strategy. First of all, in the conclusion of the book, I try to inject this notion in the French public debates. And for me, that's an attempt to, to say, let's try to think, you know, with, a, with an horizon of uh, 20 for, for 30 years and not only with an horizon of five years. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a fact that this notion is uh, less widespread you know, in our public debate than, uh, than elsewhere. Um, second, the, the big issue is uh, the one you have um, you have raised. You know this. Uh, in fact, all the U.S. try to 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 make their alliance pivot uh, with this um, uh, strategic rivalry they do have with uh, with China, and that's the the um, the biggest issue for all of us, given everything we have already said. 
And the third level is is a very um, it is really for, for for France itself. You know, in the book, I, I use a, a sentence from a, a famous uh, French writer, which is to say, the history of of France when you see it uh, uh, over centuries, it is a balance between land and sea. So it's a, a way for me to be back to your uh, interest for geopolitics because it's, it's, for instance, that's a big difference at the same time with Germany, which is less uh, sea-oriented than France. And that's a big difference with the UK, which is completely sea-oriented, you know, historically. To, to, to some extent. And for us, that's this balance. You know, uh, our security was uh, all the time a continental problem and continue to be with the things coming from the, the, the east or the thing coming from the, the, the south now. But we have also this ability to project power and to be very far away from our lands. And it's continue, for instance, with Indo-Pacific. So, if you think in these terms, you know, this balance between sea and land, I do believe there is a French grand strategy. Very good point to conclude. Uh, thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, uh, our guest was uh, Thomas Gomart, uh, the author of the book, Guerre Invisible, Invisible uh, The Wars, uh, Invisible Wars. I hope it's visible at least on my screen. Uh, highly recommended, great book, uh, very, very good read. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Atak. And you all stay tuned uh, to more episodes and uh, interviews and debates at Strategy in Future. Thank you, my name, Jacek Bartosiak. <laughs>